Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, our webinar, Roles for Behavioral Science in COVID-19 vaccin uh, COVID Vaccination Efforts. This is a webinar um, organized by the National Institutes of Health uh, Science and Behavior Change Program, or SOBC. I'm Don Edmondson. Uh, I'm the PI of the uh, SOBC Resource and Coordinating Center and Associate Professor and Director for the Center for Behavioral Cardiovascular Health at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, we are very excited to be here today. And the reason that SOBC is uh, supporting this webinar is that the SOBC program has been around for a long time um, and supported by everywhere from the uh, Office of the Director at NIH, uh, National Institute of Aging, as well as many uh, institutes across the NIH. Um, the, the core of the SOBC program is the experimental medicine approach. We bring together basic uh, translational and clinical scientists who are focused on behavior change to use the experimental medicine approach to influence mechanisms of behavior change to bring about uh, change in behavior. So today we have three experts in behavioral science, uh, Dr. Heather Brand from, the, uh, from St. Jude, my hometown of Memphis. Dr. Brand is director of the HPV Cancer Prevention Program and co-associate director for outreach uh, there at St. Jude. She'll tell us about implementation challenges and solutions for COVID vaccination. Next, we'll have Dr. Katie Milkman, who is from Penn. She is the James Deenan Professor at the Wharton School, and as well as the co-director for the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. And she'll tell us about a mega study on nudging vaccine adoptions. Finally, we have Dr. Jasmine Tiro, who will tell us about promising active engagement strategies to address COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Um, vaccination hesitancy, this is a, uh, a great example of one of these mechanisms of behavior change because we can measure it well, uh, we may be able to influence it, and by influencing it, we may be able to change behavior. And that's really at the core of the SOBC program this notion of identifying uh, mechanisms that are measurable, that we can influence, and by influencing them, bring about behavior change. Dr. Tiro is uh, Associate Professor of Department of Population and Data Sciences um, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. Um, these three experts have been amazing. We've had um, an opportunity to do some practice runs and, and talk with one another about uh, the presentations that they'll give, and they are uh, deeply uh, expert in their areas, uh, and they have information about perhaps the most challenging behavioral um, issue that our society has ever faced. Um, and they've been incredibly generous with their time, incredibly generous with their expertise, because they are all very, very busy in this time, as you can imagine. Um, so we plan to use their time wisely. I'm trying to run through this as quickly as possible. And I wanna give you some foundational information so that they don't have to cover it, so that we're all working from the same place. Uh, in terms of that foundational knowledge, first, multiple highly effective vaccines exist. Uh, full vaccination for the ones that exist require, uh, requires two doses, uh, weeks apart, which is its own special behavioral challenge. Uh, vaccines themselves require cold storage um, and are apparently fragile. Um, distribution strategies vary by nation, state, county, and community. Uh, we have vaccination priorities for the people who will get vaccines, uh, who are eligible to get vaccines first, next, uh, and sort of being able to communicate that and for people to be able to, uh, uh, to conform to those priorities um, is a, a challenge itself. And implementation of a system for getting vaccines, uh, the first vaccine to someone, tracking them and getting the second vaccination, uh, is, uh, as you can imagine, a, a magnificent challenge. And then finally, barriers to individual uh, individuals who need to be vaccinated, uh, being willing to receive the vaccine are widespread for lots of different reasons. And our experts will tell us about how um, they understand many of these issues, will tell us in much more depth and, and how uh, behavioral science can play a role in addressing them. 
Um, this is one of our largest uh, uh, webinars that we've had with SOBC uh, because there's a great deal of interest, of course. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we have an opportunity both to get questions from the audience so that people um, can uh, engage with these experts and also uh, at the end that they'll have an opportunity to engage with one another um, to be able to sort of, sort of fill out uh, the point of view of each. Um, so the way we're gonna do it is um, after me, Dr. Brandt will go and uh, she'll drive her own Zoom. Uh, and then after each person will, uh, will switch over to have a different driver. And during that switch time, we'll do one question about that individual's presentation. Um, and then at the end, we'll have a full Q&A and discussion period. Uh, and so I, we'll ask each of our uh, audience members, if you're interested, please type your questions in at any point uh, using the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, so now I'm gonna uh, take away the driving and uh, give it to Dr. Brandt who will take over driving. Um, and thank you for being here, Dr. Brandt. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Edmondson, and thank you for the opportunity to join this talented group of scholars that discuss opportunities uh, for social and behavioral science research and implementation of COVID-19 vaccines. So as we talk about the COVID-19 pandemic today, I'm gonna to be thinking of the people I know who've been infected, who've been hospitalized, and those I know who've lost their lives to COVID-19. Behind every one of these numbers is a person, a grandparent, a parent, a, a sister, a brother, a coworker, a neighbor, a friend. And the toll of the pandemic is significant and is going to continue to have very long lasting effects. And the significance can't be understated. So as of earlier this week, the World Health Organization reported nearly 84 million cases of confirmed coronavirus and more than 1.8 million deaths worldwide. And in the United States, there have been more than 20 million cases. That number is changing every day and more than 350,000 deaths, also a number that's changing every day. So the pandemic has certainly taken a toll on all of us and how we are, how we live, work, play, and pray in our daily lives. But in the last month, we've witnessed a remarkable and exciting development in efforts to slow and stop the spread of the pandemic in the form of COVID-19 vaccines. Many years of previous research, uh, so knowing how to sequence the SARS-CoV-2 virus and past developments in mRNA vaccines led to the ability to develop and test vaccines for safety and effectiveness very quickly in response to the pandemic. I won't have time today to get into all of these different types of COVID-19 vaccines, but I am happy to answer as I can in the question and answer box uh, during the webinar today and direct you to resources for more information. But all vaccines work by exposing the body to molecules from the target pathogen to trigger an immune response. But the method of how this exposure occurs varies. And these are some of the different types of vaccines that are being studied or currently available for COVID-19. So the COVID-19 vaccine is gonna help our body develop immunity to coronavirus without us having to get sick. Uh, and the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines that have been approved for emergency use in the United States are messenger RNA vaccines. And researchers have been working with mRNA vaccines for many years uh, and also have learned to sequence the virus very quickly. So all of the pieces of the puzzle sort of came together. So sequence the virus, check has a spike protein, check. Ideal for mRNA vaccines, check. And so putting those pieces together resulted in being able to very quickly uh, get into clinical trials. And the next steps for clinical trials, ensuring safety and effectiveness were because of the many years of previous research and lots of funding to support multiple and very large trials. And then the pandemic itself being motivated by illness, morbidity and loss of life. So 
I will mention um, quickly here uh, that the AstraZeneca vaccine is a viral vector style vaccine, which is different than the mRNA vaccines. And that's fairly significant from an implementation standpoint because the cold storage requirements don't exist for that particular type of vaccine. So more to come on that as we anticipate review and approval. So Dr. Edmondson reviewed uh, the basics about the currently available vaccines. So the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine and Moderna vaccines, again, both messenger RNA vaccines, both are highly effective, uh, both require um, two doses. So you can see here that there are some cold storage requirements, which result in implementation um, challenges that I will discuss during my time today. So we're in the middle of a pandemic. The FDA has granted emergency use authorization for these two vaccines. Let's go, right? Well, sort of, but let's also acknowledge the current situation does not lend itself to mass vaccination in schools right now or in other public settings in quite the same way as previous mass vaccine campaigns, although this is a possibility um, in the future. So the two available vaccines aren't the same as the flu, smallpox, or polio vaccines, and the unique storage requirements of the two available vaccines right now limit the settings in which people can currently access these vaccines. And there are candidates, as I mentioned, like the AstraZeneca vaccine that may be reviewed and approved in the future that will allow for us to think about the ways in which mass vaccination has occurred previously and been successful. So Dr. Larry Corey of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in a National Academies webinar late last year uh, reminded all of us vaccines don't save lives, vaccinating people saves lives. So vaccines in cold storage or a refrigerator do little good if we're unable to vaccinate people. And I'm not going to get into the current discussions about alternate strategies to the emergency use authorization. I will say that modifying a dosing amount, dosing dosing schedule or mixing and matching products to increase vaccination seems futile if the delivery system, the process of implementing an effective and efficient process to administer vaccines isn't working. So while we may want to get more data on these alternate approaches, I think we have an immediate opportunity to focus on implementation challenges. So the National Academies developed a phased approach or framework to guide equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. And these phases were used uh, to promote preliminary guidance for each state to develop a plan for COVID-19 vaccination. And the idea was that the greatest access would be needed among the most vulnerable. And this was anticipated because of supply chain issues and demand exceeds available supply. So the National Academy framework was used by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup to be able to take a look at the evidence and the framework for equitable distribution and build on that to provide additional direction to the states. So here you may notice that phase one was expanded into A, B, and C from the initial framework of just A and B to allow some specificity and recommendations for allocation. Again, and this is important, each state takes these recommendations under consideration, but there's no federal coordination or requirement for following the framework exactly. Vaccine dose allocation may follow this prioritization, but it's not guaranteed that actual vaccinations will follow this order. And it's likely there will be great variation in what's happening from one state to the next, and even within states from one county or community to the next. So how are we doing? Well, I'm certain if you've watched the news at all over the last few weeks, you've received these updates with about 15 and a half million doses of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines distributed. We see that there's been about 4.6 million first doses actually received. And the percent of doses is widely variable from state to state. South Dakota uh, earlier this week had the highest percent of vaccine doses actually distributed at about 62%. And Kansas was the lowest at 15%. But there's a wide range uh, here to be acknowledged. 
So as of yesterday, although these numbers already changed uh, today, but as of yesterday, only about 30% of vaccines distributed had been administered. The timing of distribution of vaccines during the holiday season really contributed to slow uptake, and there continues to be major implementation challenges at play. So what do these plans look like on a more granular level? Well, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Tennessee. Uh, and remember, each state has control over its vaccination program. The federal government in the U.S. shifted implementation to the states, unlike other countries, such as the United Kingdom, India, or Japan. And within states, some states have then charged counties or local jurisdictions for implementation of vaccination programs. So you can see here, Tennessee has put forth their plan. All of these state plans are publicly available and plans may be updated as new information comes to bear. Tennessee is doing quite well right now considering the conditions in terms of administration, especially since these data do reflect the holiday period during which administration slowed. I'm using the CDC COVID vaccine trackers, but Bloomberg has an excellent vaccine tracker and in fact shows a higher percentage of uptake in the state of Tennessee right now, just over 50%. This is really a credit to the state's expertise. So the state commissioner, Dr. Lisa Piercy, the medical director, for immunizations, Dr. Shelley Fiscus, uh, they, they were prepared and mobilized quickly a team across the state to really um, introduce different products and plans. One thing I wanted to share is each state is collecting data differently, but you can see here that who is being vaccinated is something we'll want to also monitor. One of the things that stands out to me in the data being collected um, are that uh, race and ethnicity is unknown for a relatively large proportion of those who've been vaccinated. So that will certainly be something to continue to monitor considering the known disparities. So every day the state is rolling out new tools. In fact, not shown here is a new interactive tool that was rolled out late yesterday where someone in Tennessee can go enter some personal information and be directed to their exact phase. So it's getting quite sophisticated in how they are able to convey and communicate information about vaccine phase and everything coming back to the phase and different strategies for ensuring that the public um, is aware of these different uh, implementation plans because we know there's a lot of anxiety out there and people want to know when is it their turn, especially for those who are very motivated right now to be vaccinated. So the pandemic has illuminated a lot of implementation challenges, um, ensuring adequate PPE for healthcare and other essential workers, enacting effective testing and contact tracing protocols. And the pandemic has shown us just how underfunded some of this infrastructure is with, again, great variability from state to state. So states are responsible for handling a lot of this, all of this, basically, and they've received very limited additional funding and are simply running on fumes in terms of what they're able to accomplish and are doing the best they can with uh, really uh, challenging circumstances. So I like to think about this very simply that what we're trying to do is we're trying to get the COVID vaccines into practice uh, by ensuring that vaccines become vaccinations so that we can prevent severe disease. That's ultimately the goal here. And this notion of if you build it, they will come is a concept that doesn't always quickly apply or readily apply in all circumstances. So in addition to the behavioral risk mitigation strategies, that exists. Uh, we know what to do and we know what health outcome we want to achieve, but how do we get there? So it's this how part that offers the complexity. And so the how part of the process or the strategies that we're going to use to get what we know works into widespread practice for population level benefit speaks to implementation strategies that may need to be adapted to various contexts and for rep uh, greater scalability and replication in the future. We also know that there are influences across multiple levels and also in multiple settings. So the inner and outer setting of implementation is going to influence vaccination uptake, acceptance and uptake, as well as availability and other dimensions of access. 
So implementation science offers us the opportunity to really think about what are the best methods to promote adoption of this evidence-based approach of COVID vaccination to prevent severe disease. So I noted about the public health infrastructure being overburdened, and we know that capacity in many different ways is insufficient right now or has some level of proficiency but could require some support. And that stems from organizational culture and leadership, available resources, and even hearing recently that having needles to administer the vaccines, how are those or are those not available to be successful with such a program? And then disinformation uh, factors in here because we've been in an environment with such anti-science rhetoric and disinformation related to the whole pandemic. So who can you trust? What can you trust? And from what sources becomes paramount? Dr. Tiro is gonna talk more about vaccine hesitancy, but I just wanted to mention this as an important implementation challenge. Implementation processes and outcomes are certainly important to consider, and I really relied on the five A's that come from work of Penchansky and Thomas from years ago that really make sense here to thinking about various implementation barriers that exist in terms of availability, making sure we have supply, supplies reaching the right people at the right time, accessibility, making sure that vaccines get to people in a proximal manner, affordability, while the vaccine cost may be at no, uh, free, there may be administration fees, and then accommodation. We've heard a lot about 24-7 vaccination opportunities to really ensure that we're delivering, and acceptability, which is, of course, linked to disinformation and hesitancy. So what do these implementation challenges look like in practice? Well, here's an example in Shelby County in Tennessee. They use this same branding and look for all of the pandemic-related communication. And as you can see here, this uh, indicates that now they're closed. Well, that's because supply of vaccine doses continues to be an issue. Availability is a critical aspect of implementation. Um, there's also a lot of uncertainty. Right now, various facilities are waiting for their second doses of Pfizer vaccination for the 21-day period after the first one to begin administering those. And there's quite frankly some uncertainty about uh, will they be here tomorrow as their schedule. They were supposed to be here Monday. Will they be here tomorrow? Uh, because it does influence the ability to ensure adherence to the dosing schedule. And the two vaccines that are available do require cold storage, and that really limits which entities can even manage a supply of doses. A review of initial COVID-19 vaccine plans that were filed. Remember, each state files their own plan to the CDC resulted in a very interesting analysis it just off the bat. And they shared challenges that were common or similar across the states. And one consistent theme was a desperate need for support to ensure uh, capacity for vaccination programs. And public health agencies play a critical role in managing epidemics. They've been systematically underfunded and uh, really pushed to the side in terms of a disinvestment in public health. And we know that there's going to be a need for intentional and strategic investment right now to make sure that states have what they need to be successful. So you've heard about mobilizing the National Guard in some states. Uh, you've heard about reaching out to retired healthcare workers, like what resources are available that can be mobilized quickly. And I also want to add that there's value to ensuring mechanisms for sharing information across states. Where are things going well and how can those processes potentially be adapted and implemented in other settings with success. So the pandemic has highlighted uh, a lot of gaps uh, that we already were aware of for underserved and vulnerable populations and really exacerbated the presence of those. And public health system preparedness is really paramount for those populations. So the SEAL Alliance is uh, an effort across several states, including Tennessee, that is direct addressing the toll of the pandemic on African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, American Indian and Alaska Native communities that have suffered disproportionately as a result of the pandemic to make sure that they're engaging trusted partners and messengers uh, around to uh, misinformation and also the importance of inclusion in ongoing research. 
um, there have already been reports of vast unevenness in vaccine rollout, rollout across various states. Um, that's to be expected when it falls under uh, state control and different setups in each state exist in the absence of federal coordination. Um, so when differences are observed, are we understanding why they exist and acting quickly to remedy those? Um, there should be transparency in reporting who's vaccinated, so we can do that. And this also importantly entails examining the structural roles of racism and exclusion in such systems expected to perform under the guise of equitable distribution. There's a lot of messaging happening related to the pandemic. Here's one example for the state of Tennessee through targeted ads, social media, mass media. Um, and here's one at the local level that's reinforcing behavioral strategies in addition to notifying about vaccination opportunities. And vaccine intention is shaped by knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs, as well as components of access. And we've consistently seen increased confidence in vaccination. And Dr. Tiro will talk more about the important role of hesitancy. So with a focus on equity and inclusion, the concept of a trusted messenger can't be overstated. And earlier this, uh, excuse me, at the end of last year, Dr. David Chambers authored a viewpoint in implementation research and practice on the importance of ensuring as we're implementing interventions related to the pandemic, that we're acknowledging that different stakeholders have different needs for information and intervention, and we're aligning those. So I shared a few examples about the communication. We need to be messaging, using trusted messengers, engaging trusted partners, and ensuring that the messages are coming through channels that are easily accessible. So pharmacies are going to play a really important role in distribution of vaccines. And currently, there are 19 chain or franchise, franchise excuse me, pharmacies who have contracts uh, with the federal government through HHS to administer vaccines in long-term care facilities. So what this map is showing based on a recent analysis, all of those red dots are counties where there's no presence of those federal partnership uh, pharmacies. So this represents at least 750 counties that don't have an eligible pharmacy for vaccination. And this is a major concern for people living in rural areas as well as in other medically underserved communities because access becomes a critical issue. And we really need to consider community clinical linkages. Uh, we also need to think about vac bringing vaccinations to people using mobile strategies. And and perhaps mass vaccination efforts will be uh, available to us in the future to replicate that style of mass vaccination. We can learn a lot from those different approaches, but multiple access points will be essential. So how do we ensure vaccines become vaccinations? Well, we have to address these implementation challenges, supply, funding and resources, leading and practicing equity and inclusion, who shares information through what channels and also various access points. So we have two vaccines that are highly effective in preventing severe illness, and we know that these barriers exist, so we have to ensure states have what they need. They're being asked to do a lot without receiving more. And access encompasses these multiple dimensions to be addressed. And we want to make sure that program strategies, vaccination program strategies, are aligned with meeting people where they are building trust, especially for communities that have been marginalized and minoritized over the years. And there are many opportunities for pragmatic investigations of what's unfolding with the COVID vaccination programs. And implementation science really offers us a lot of guidance in how to do this. So it's exciting to be uh, in the field right now. And I believe we can capitalize on the expertise and ex uh, experiences of many disciplines and many voices to really ultimately achieve success with the vaccination implementation processes. And quite honestly, uh, a lot of people are expecting us to get this right because our, our lives and well-being and that of our neighbors really depend on this. So it's a big moment for this type of work and ensuring how we can get vaccines uh, to be vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brandt. That was excellent and uh, incredibly informative. Um, 
We have a couple of questions um, as uh, Lily takes uh, the, the driver's seat for Dr. Milkman's presentation. And they, they seem to be around um, uh, the data collection uh, for race and ethnicity and how we're doing in these different areas. Um, who's, who's responsible for, for collecting those data? Who's doing it well? And then another question around, um, is there evidence that socioeconomic status is allowing some people to jump the line uh, or that it's influencing access to the vaccine right now? Sure, so to the first point, there are different required data elements that must be reported related to vaccination. These are spelled out in each state's vaccination plan and they're 72 hours uh, from the time of administration to when those data must be reported. And those data come from a number of different sites. So local public health departments that are vaccinating 75 plus folks right now, individual clinical settings that are vaccinating frontline healthcare workers, essential workers in the pandemic. And so it's really on the onus of whoever's administering to ensure accurate collection for reporting. So I would say the states have a very decentralized approach right now to collecting that information. So part of our efforts are going to have to be to ensure that at that site, that the importance of collecting that particular data point matters because we do want to understand who is getting the vaccine because the whole idea here is that we're implementing something that's equitable. Now, implementing something that's equitable in a system that may have not been designed for that type of distribution poses its own set of challenges. But I think at the very least, we can convey how important it is to have that particular data element for us to track and monitor and intervene when we see huge discrepancies. And to the second point, um, anecdotally, there certainly have been many reports of different ways of circumventing the equitable framework. I think that's absolutely to be expected. And at this point, it's a little unclear about what ramifications there are for doing so. In the state of New York, the governor has indicated uh, very um, severe fines if there's evidence of that. Um, in other states, there's there have also been reports of that. So do I think that's happening? Yes. Do I know what to do about it? Not, I don't have a lot of ideas about right now how to do that. I think part of this is trusting that people will do the right thing. And, uh, you know, that's always mired with uh, unintended consequences, but we certainly have heard evidence of that happening. And I'm happy to answer additional questions in the chat or later during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brandt, um, outstanding. Um, I, I wanted also to tell our attendees before we move on, um, at the end, we, uh, if you're thinking about how, uh, what science you might uh, want to do in response to some of the information you're getting today, uh, Dr. Luke Stokel will be um, uh, the representative from NIH uh, who will uh, sort of wrap things up for us at the end and describe some of the opportunities uh, that are available uh, at the National Institutes for Health um, to address some of these things. Um, at this point, I want to turn it over to Dr. Katherine Milkman. Hi, everyone. Um, Lily has generously offered to do the, the slide sharing because I am in a spot with not as much internet bandwidth as I was hoping to have today. Um, we all make do during a pandemic. So uh, I, I'm going to be presenting some work that I've done with a very large team of collaborators. If the list of people on this slide is making you dizzy, it makes me a little dizzy too. Um, I, I lead a an institute at the University of Pennsylvania called the Behavior Change for Good Initiative. And what we focus on is um, trying to figure out uh, smart ways to change behavior for good, and both for the better and long term, uh, with a team of about 130 different scientists who are distributed around the world and are interdisciplinary and have expertise in behavior change. And so we, we form big collaborations and do big projects together. So we turned our attention naturally in this year of pandemic to thinking about how do we change behavior around vaccination and specifically around encouraging COVID-19 vaccination. Lily, would you mind advancing the slide? Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to, I'm starting with a plug actually for a couple of op-eds that go into a bit more detail on uh, past research than I'll go to, into in this um, talk. 
The first is an op-ed I co-authored in June about the importance of thinking not only about how we could scale up distribution uh, and how we could actually scale up production and also, of course, successfully develop a vaccine, but also that back in June when we were thinking about Operation Warp Speed, a, a component of that needed to be thinking about how we would encourage adoption of the vaccine. And um, so we, we put out an op-ed highlighting the opportunity to actually think of the 2020 flu season as a, or the fall 2020 flu season as a test bed, just as we were testing strategies to vaccinate, um, excuse me, just as, as vaccines were being tested, we could test strategies to encourage vaccination if we actually turned our attention to doing large trials encouraging flu vaccination in 2020. And this op-ed did end up leading to some opportunities for us to do that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about our our big randomized controlled trials and what we learned from those. Could you advance, Lily? Thank you. And the other op-ed I wanted to plug is a piece I had the opportunity to write for The Economist um, actually just about a month ago that highlights two challenges that I see as distinct to encouraging vaccination based on past research on challenges like the COVID-19 vaccine. And the first challenge I think is the one that uh, Dr. Tiro is gonna talk about in a moment, and that's really hesitancy. How do we encourage people to feel more confident and comfortable and persuade them that this is a safe, well-vetted vaccine that is right for them? Uh, and there's a lot that goes into that. Dr. Tiro will really focus on it. I highlight you know, the p power of social uh, norms, conveying that everyone else is doing it, the power of avoiding misinformation, et cetera. But I think actually the more important point point I make, and this is where I'm going to focus the rest of my time with you today, is that there's a second challenge that we need to think about, which is even once once you've persuaded people to do something that this is in their best interest and they're on board, um, past research shows that only about 40 to 70 percent of people, depending on the action, will actually follow through. So we see, see this when it comes to getting flu shots. The flu vaccination rate, even though it's recommended for essentially everyone in America has never crossed the 50% threshold. But if you just ask people, do they intend to get a flu vaccine, you get many more saying yes. We see the same thing with voting, obviously top of mind today after the Georgia runoff. Uh, a lot of people register to vote, so they intend to vote and then don't turn out. We see this with all sorts of other medical uh, decisions. And so that follow through challenge is really important. And I think we need to be focusing attention on that. And that's really where our work has focused. Say you have someone who's convince this is a reasonable course of action and they're they're comfortable maybe they're a little bit hesitant but they're they're comfortable enough if asked in the survey they say okay i do it but how do we actually make sure they follow through okay so let's go on to the next slide and i'll talk more about follow through so before i actually share some of the work that we did this fall on flu shots i want to talk briefly about a study i ran now a decade ago on flu shots that i think has some bearing on this challenge um, we ran an experiment with a a large Midwestern employer that held flu shot clinics on site for its employees and um, had done so for years. They were free. You just walked right into your workplace and you could get a jab. And they normally sent out a nicely designed reminder mailing, letting folks know that they could come at the following dates and times at this location, get a free flu shot. And we said, you know, we think we can do better than that. We have a design that, that can improve on that a bit. And really, if you advance the slide, you'll see the the second version of the mailing that we decided to run in a test, all we added here was a simple prompt to people to make a plan. When they get this piece of mail from their employer, they're encouraged, um, write down the date and time you intend to get a vaccine. Now, importantly, this is not an appointment card. So we weren't inviting people to schedule a time because that was actually not feasible uh, in this case. These are just walk-in clinics. But what we knew from past research in psychology is that when people think through a concrete plan about exactly when and where and how they'll do something, they're more likely to follow through because they start thinking about obstacles like, you know, will I have childcare? Will I have access to a, a car and transit? Will I put this on my calendar and make sure I don't have a conflict? And then the calendar will remind me. And so we thought this would be effective at ensuring actual follow through rather than just an intention to get a flu shot. Um, we ran a randomized controlled trial. Lily um, could advance. You guys will see, I think, you might have to click twice and there will be little people randomized, Lily, if you don't mind. Sorry for the hassle. Lily, could you advance the slide? All right, well, I'm wondering if I'm having bandwidth issues since I am not seeing the slide advanced. I will just keep telling you about what happens and, and if you guys, uh, 
Okay, I just got shut out and I will hopefully be able to log back in in a moment. I apologize for the technical issues. I'm, um, as I said, not in the ideal spot for this. So let me describe the study. Um, we had uh, about 3,000 people roughly randomized to these two different groups and they saw uh, one of our messages. And what we found is if you um, advance to our results slide, about a, a four percentage point boost in the rate at which people got their vaccines simply from prompting them to think through the date and time when they follow through. That might sound like a small effect, but it's at zero cost. And uh, I think it's one of a number of studies that demonstrates the power of simply understanding the psychology of decisions and nudging follow through uh, with that understanding. Okay, I'm back. I can see everything again. Sorry about that, guys. If you could advance to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about how we're gonna take this insight and try to scale it up. So we knew that cheap, simple tools like this could help us follow through on vaccination. We hope people will use planning prompts. And by the way, uh, defaulting people into a scheduled time slot is also really an effective way, according to past research, to increase follow through. We wanted to take this in kind of insight and scale it up. And so we decided this was a right problem for what we call a mega study of the Behavior Change for Good initiative. And a mega study is a study that involves, um, instead of just one test of one idea, like what I showed you, many tests launched in parallel. So we actually ran a tournament back in the, uh, in the late spring where we invited scientists from around the world to submit ideas for what they thought might be effective messaging to nudge follow through on flu vaccinations. And we asked them specifically to think about things that they thought might port over to encourage COVID-19 vaccinations. So they weren't focused on safety or persuasion. They're really focused much more on saying, hey, follow through, this is the thing you wanna do. Let's get you in the door and make sure you actually show up for your vaccination. And, um, and we pull those and run them simultaneously. So many, many studies all embedded together run simultaneously and we can do these head-to-head -head horse races and see what works best. Okay, so if you could advance to the next slide. Thank you. Okay, so the first study, which is, I actually think in many ways, the most exciting that we launched this fall was in partnership with Walmart pharmacies. And what Walmart pharmacies did is they, they text messaged um, hundreds of thousands of their customers to encourage them to come and get a flu vaccine. These were customers who had gotten a flu vaccine before and had opted into getting text messages from their pharmacy. And patients were randomly assigned to one of 23 different study conditions, testing all sorts of different messaging that our scientists came up from, came up with, excuse me. And these messages all went out on September 25th. Uh, and some of them were interactive. Uh, some of them, you know, asked a question and asked you to respond. Um, sometimes there was a follow-up message that you got a couple of days later. And we actually don't have the data back yet, but we are expecting it any minute. So all I can tell you is stay tuned. Um, we hope to be able to publish results by the end of this month. And that will hopefully be uh, in time to inform vaccine campaigns at pharmacies like CVS and Walmart and Walgreens when we, we get to the next phase of distribution. Okay. Let me tell you about a study though, where I do have results. Um, Lily, could you advance to the next slide? Great, okay, so this is our, our project where I actually do have some results that I'm gonna be able to share today. It was actually done in parallel, also in the fall, but instead of focusing on pharmacy customers, we were focused on patients who were coming in for healthy visits at two large health systems in the Northeast, Penn Medicine and Geisinger Health. So every patient who had a healthy visit scheduled with their primary care physician was randomized to one of 20 different experimental conditions in this study. Again, the team of scientists built different text messaging, um, and, and here the focus is on trying to get people to accept a vaccine or even ask for a vaccine from their provider during that healthy visit. So when we randomly assign you to conditions, it determines what messages you'll receive in the three days leading up to your doctor's visit. And we had about 40,000 people in this trial. So considerably smaller in scale than what we did with Walmart, but considerably larger in scale than most studies that have been done uh, encouraging flu vaccination. It was about half female, a little more than half, um, a little older on average and, and pretty diverse in terms of the demographic makeup. And the vaccination rate in our control group, one group didn't get messages, and that's what we're comparing against. The vaccination rate in that control group was 44%. And so we're going to see, can we move the needle, uh, pun intended, on vaccination up from 44%? Uh, if you could advance, then I'll start telling you about some results. So the really good news is that uh, compared to a standard care control, which is just, you know, 
business as usual, the way doctor's appointments normally go, you maybe get a reminder to come into the doctor's office, but no text messaging support to encourage vaccination. We do see that we found some messages that are very effective. In fact, every single message we tested um, is a dot in this graph. And you can see all of them uh, are to the right of that standard care control, meaning they led to some estimated increase in flu vaccination uh, compared to doing nothing but um, only a few of them are statistically significant. So it's many more than you would expect by chance. 21% are significantly improving outcomes. So this definitely suggests that there is power in this kind of a reminder strategy for increasing follow through. And I wanna just focus on the top performer, which you know, whatever multiple comparisons um, kind of correction you make to the statistics, shines through as a successful strategy and it's something that we can basically emulate and, and is portable. So if Lily, you could go to the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like. So this is our most successful performer. And there were lots of, I will say, like clever messages folks designed, putting you in competition with other regions or uh, telling you a joke. It was a really simple messaging strategy that proved the most effective. It was two reminders, one sent 72 hours before an appointment, letting you know you could get a flu vaccine and that you should do so to protect your family um, and yourself. Uh, and that you should look out for another reminder right before the appointment. And then a second message 24 hours beforehand. And I think this may be a critical component, highlighting that a flu vaccine had been reserved for you at your doctor's appointment. And all you need to do is just please make sure you ask the doctor to receive it. So this led to a 10% increase, a four percentage point, but 10% increase in vaccination at essentially zero cost. The marginal cost of sending these messages is um, something like two cents. So really, really inexpensive thing that health systems could do, not only of course to nudge flu vaccines in future years, but if we could get health systems sending these kinds of messages out as soon as the vaccine is available for widespread use, it may be exactly the kind of thing that will encourage follow through. Okay, Lily, it'd be great if you could advance. Thank you. All right, let me wrap up here. And actually Lily, it's fine if you sort of advance a few times and I'll get all four of those takeaways. Oops, sorry, one back. Perfect. The key things that I just want to leave you with is it does seem that we have the ability with behavioral science to help nudge vaccine adopt adoption. I think a key focus should be on the follow through problem. Persuasion, I think, is better done through some other techniques than, say, text messaging or, or email reminders that so we can work on that as well. But follow through is going to be a big challenge and nudging can help. Um, we did find that these two reminder messages that just ask people to ask for their flu shot and let them know it was reserved to, for them were really effective. Uh, another thing I didn't mention, but I do think is worth noting is that interventions we found were about four times as effective on average at the health system in our study that had lower baseline vaccination rates. So one of our health systems had about a 35% vaccination rate in the baseline group. The other had about a uh, 50% vaccination rate. And while we saw the same message order, so sort of the top performing message was the top performing at both sites, it was about four times bigger, the lift that it produced at the lower uh, vaccine compliance site. So we may wanna focus these efforts, particularly in settings where we expect there won't be as much take up at baseline. And finally, we're really eagerly waiting results from our Walmart trial, so we'll be able to inform messaging at the pharmacy level and look forward to being able to share that as well. Okay, so I'm actually, I'll, I'll stop there and hopefully we're okay on time. I'm happy to take a, a question um, or, uh, you know, talk about anything else. I'm seeing questions both in the, in the open chat and in the other. So let me, um, let me just answer the first one because that's a fair heuristic, right? And then I'd love to talk about these others at, towards the end. Uh, on the first question, which is just, is this different from a factorial randomized controlled trial? Um, it's no, it's really very similar to a random, I mean, it's just a big randomized controlled trial. We call it a mega study because different teams design different components of it. And we basically launch a bunch of different studies that would normally be launched in isolation all in parallel with the same outcome variable, the same randomization scheme, so we can make apples to apples comparisons. But it's really just a giant randomized controlled trial with many arms is a good way to think about it. Um, and I hope that's helpful. And I'm gonna, I guess, defer the other questions, but look forward to answering them towards the end. Thank you, Dr. Milton, amazing. Um, okay, so now we're gonna uh, turn it over uh, to Dr. Tiro. Uh, who should uh, be taking over driving uh, the, the Zoom at this point. Perfect. Good morning, or good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak with such a distinguished group of, of women. It's very exciting to see that a panel of women presenting. Um, and I'm excited to share with you some promising intervention strategies to address hesitancy about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and what I want to start in terms of goals is just to, um, to orient you that um, I wanted to give you a better understanding of why people are hesitant, um, the key messages about the vaccine that need to reach all groups, all segments of the population, and why I believe active engagement with a stepped intervention strategy approach is critical, because um, not all will respond to um, the type of nudge that um, Dr. Milkman um, described earlier. So many of you are familiar with diffusion of innovation theory represented by the graph on the right. And simply put, whether a, a new technology like a vaccine comes out, we can expect a certain percentage of the population to be ready to immediately adopt the intervention. Um, the people who wait in line for the new iPhone, the people who called their doctor the same day that FDA approved the COVID vaccine, and others will respond to a nudge as noted by Dr. Milkman, while others will wait. They want to see if it works, or they don't believe this new tech is needed. For vaccines to prevent, protect the community, we need to achieve a 70 to 80% adoption rate. And so our goal is to make the cumulative curve shown here as steep and as fast as possible in time. But we know that vaccine specific and individual and contextual factors really influence the adoption curve. And in 2019, before the COVID pandemic hit, the World Health Organization named vaccine hesitancy a top 10 global health threat. The attitudes and the mental models that drive people to hesitate or to outright refuse vaccines are diverse and really frustrating for public health advocates like myself. Now, some of us handle that with funny cartoons like this one on the right, but these fears and beliefs about autism, that there are toxins in vaccine adjuvants, that um, it is all a conspiracy to make money for pharma and how natural or organic exposures to infections um, are better for mounting an immune response than exposure to vaccines. These beliefs are real and really interfere with vaccine adoption. Um, and what we see um, in like for hesitancy for other vaccines, people exist on a continuum for the COVID-19 vaccine. This Kaiser Family Foundation survey fielded last December found that only 15% of people, respondents, would definitely not get the vaccine. The majority um, would get it um, or would probably get it. And when probed further about when they would get the vaccine, only a third of them said they would get it right away. 39% wanted to wait and see and 9% said they would only get it if it was required to do so for work or school. Groups with the highest hesitancy were Republicans, rural residents, African Americans, and essential workers, those bearing a disproportionate burden of COVID vaccine disease. Examination of the reasons for hesitancy, they centered around three themes. Risk of COVID disease, 43% stated that the COVID risk is exaggerated, and one in five people didn't think that they were at risk of getting sick from COVID. The second theme that emerged in the data were vaccine specific issues. They were worried about its newness and vaccine side effects. And finally, the third theme that emerged was trust, as mentioned by Dr. Brandt earlier. 55% reported not trusting the government to make sure the vaccine is safe and effective and half believed that politics played too much of a role in the vaccine development process. These findings are alarming and echo what vaccine experts recommend about key messages to send to the public. Specifically, experts note that these messages um, need to reach all segments of the population, that the vaccine is safe, that there's no serious short-term side effects, that data are forthcoming about long-term side effects that it's an effective dose uh, vaccine and that it is needed because everyone is at risk and that no shortcuts were taken when developing the vaccine and that it involved work over 10 years by hundreds of scientists as noted by Dr. Brandt earlier. For individuals, everyone, 
everyone is unique. And so they need reassurance that the vaccine is safe and effective for their situation, their personal health conditions. Further, African Americans, Latinx, Native American, and Alaska Native people have very good reasons to be wary of healthcare systems and biomedical research. We are digging ourselves out of a trust deficit with them, and we must partner with leaders and organizations they trust to effectively communicate their trusted messengers. It is easy for rumors and conspiracy beliefs to spread in the age of the internet. And that is why we must be upfront and transparent in all of our communications. The ground, the context is changing every day and we see vaccine confidence building as we cover more media coverage and showing more people getting the vaccine. Um, we can't predict though what misinformation or disinformation will become viral. We've got to engage in continuous monitoring of attitudes and misinformation on the internet and help people build skills to identify and discount that misinformation. This pandemic is a perfect opportunity for us to study how to build people's digital health and scientific literacy. All three aspects of these, these literacy components are different and critical for us to build ourselves out of this trust deficit. And finally, it cannot just be us, public health advocates and scientists doing this work. We must engage opinion and community leaders who acknowledge and support each individual's right to make their own decision, build their skills to make an informed decision and also highlight the collective benefits of the vaccine. But what's really important to note, as Dr. Brandt said earlier, is that our fragmented healthcare delivery system poses many vaccine implementation challenges. And this fragmentation is also true of our communication channels. So we've got to use multiple intervention strategies in a sequence to really reach all segments of the population. And one thing that I'd like to posit is that we've got to engage um, these intervention strategies in sequence. We've got to engage influencers to call attention to the importance of vaccine adoption. With government mistrust, we cannot rely just on our presidential endorsements shown on the left here, but also admired celebrities like LeBron James who have a broad reach into the population and others like him. Given vaccine hesitancy, we cannot expect that nudges or cues alone will achieve high adoption and we've got to address vaccine hesitancy. And what I'd like to spend a little bit of time is talking about promising strategies like self-persuasion and motivational interviewing. Briefly, I'd like to share work by my colleague, Dr. Austin Baldwin at Southern Methodist University and I examining self-persuasion as an intervention strategy to promote HPV vaccination. It's an intervention strategy designed to support informed decision-making and avoid decision paralysis by directing individuals who are hesitant to generate their own reasons for a health behavior. By performing the tasks noted here, people do not just passively receive information, but engage in a mechanism of deep cognitive processing. And as someone of a parent of an 11 year old who sees information go in one ear and out the other, it's that active engagement that is really critical for um, learning. We use here, a website or a kiosk in a clinic to deliver the intervention to reach our English and Spanish speakers of all health literacy levels. In the first step of the tasks, we ask people to watch a brief educational video to get background information about the health behavior or the vaccine topic. They choose then among topics and then answer verbal questions about the information in the, inform in the video. This helps them recall information from the video and helps them understand and articulate how getting the vaccine might protect their health and others in their household. Another effective question that we used to, is, if you decide to not get the vaccine today, why might you regret that decision in the future, triggering the behavioral science construct of, of um, anticipated regret? And after answering these questions, they summarize the reasons in favor of vaccination. We found in this um, study that about a third of the people who use the website wanted to get the, the vaccine after watching the video, and another third wanted to get the vaccine after answering these questions. Of course, that means that a third chose not to get the vaccine at the end. If they decided to get it, like Dr. Milkman mentioned, we help them make an action plan. 
of the third that had remaining concerns, we directed them to share their concerns with their provider. And by completing these tasks, it helped the parents identify their HPV vaccine concerns, and it really primed them to have an efficient discussion with their provider. We note that it saves time during discussions because busy providers do not often have time to do basic education about vaccines and would prefer to focus their efforts on um, the specific issues raised by parents. Nudging and self-persuasion, as I mentioned in the prior, prior slide, are not enough, and some will still have concerns and need a discussion with a provider. It's critical, though, that providers are non-judgmental in their response. Dr. Mandy Dempsey's team in Colorado has shown to great effect that motivational interviewing is one way to elicit and effectively address vaccine concerns. And my team in Dallas has also seen how providers naturally use MI techniques in a non-judgmental way. And this um, exchange showcases how provider supports a parent's decision autonomy and gently probes for the key reasons driving vaccine hesitancy. In this situation, the mother wants to do additional research um, and, uh, and finally volunteers that her concern is that the vaccine is new. But what also is noted in this exchange is that the implicit signals, um, the gentle signals that the patient sends, that the patient doesn't trust, fully trust the provider. The mother reports that she wants to do her own independent research on it. She wants to gather information from another source and not, and the provider is, is not enough, is not enough of a messenger and recommender. I think this really, uh, this exchange really highlights the importance of consistent messaging by all in the healthcare team. Communities of color may trust more than recommendations of nurses and front desk staff who resemble themselves or seek pers perspectives from other community groups. In Dallas, where I am, we are knee deep in anti-vaxxers who are very savvy communicators. And if you read through the slogan on the right, your head starts nodding. I think about, yes, I am pro-science. Yes, I am pro-research. Yes, I am pro-government transparency. And the next thing you know, you are convinced that this group, Texans for Vaccine Choice, share your values, your perspectives. But the group is actually more about helping people support the right to refuse vaccines. And it's the savviness of communications like this that highlight the importance of sequencing our intervention and engagement strategies. Brief appeals, nudges, self-persuasion, motivational inter interviewing all have their place. The one thing that I can 100% predict is that misinformation about the COVID vaccine will spread and the most vulnerable in our communities with low trust in government and public health. While we know a little about how to debunk misinformation, I will echo Dr. Brandt's earlier point about needing a trusted messenger. I think about Stacey Abrams in Georgia with her team doing grassroots engagement. Each locality, because of the fact that we are trusting localities to distribute um, and vaccinate our population, needs to find their own Stacey Abrams and harness her network to effectively reach populations exposed to misinformation. We need to get creative about how to execute um, engage populations. Now, over the past few minutes, I've highlighted some promising strategies, and they are not the only strategies that could be deployed. And please note, none of them have been tested with the COVID vaccine itself. There has not been, and there will not be time to test these strategies in a traditional behavioral intervention trial format. We can't wait though. We've got to implement as best we can and employ rigorous methods to evaluate these effects. If we use the following principles to guide our research, gathering multidisciplinary teams, being sensitive to the local context, focusing on the intervention needs at multiple levels of patients, healthcare systems, the local community, engaging community stakeholders in the development and the evaluation of the strategies we deploy and designing for widespread dissemination, we will advance our understanding of how to address vaccine hesitancy. It won't be the perfectly controlled clinical trial, but we will learn something. And with that, I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and take some questions. 
Thank you, Dr. Tiro. Uh, fascinating and, and uh, exciting to see uh, uh, interventions that can uh, actually address this mechanism that is clearly important today. Um, a couple of the questions that came through in the, in the Q&A um, that I think uh, touch everyone's research that's presented today are around um, age differences in both uh, hesitancy and perhaps the effectiveness of interventions uh, like Dr. Milkman's uh, nudges or messages or, or uh, Dr. Tiro's um, motivational interviewing. Uh, could you talk, uh, Dr. Tiro, uh, about uh, age differences or socioeconomic differences in uh, hesitancy and different types of fears and whether these interventions uh, are expected to sort of uh, influence similarly across age or SES? I think the question really speaks to a couple of different points. There's the opportunity for some of these belief systems to intersect with each other, right? So um, we've done some latent clinical analysis to understand if you have um, fears about the safety of vaccines combined with fears about conspiracies uh, and, and the trust in the government, then who sends the message about that the vaccines are safe may be even more important for you to think about in the design and the reach, right? as opposed to um, someone who doesn't have that same underlying concern about con conspiracy beliefs. It might be a much easier effort. You can just do a straightforward, you know, anonymous, right? Not via a specific messenger to send the message of, of the fact that the vaccines are safe, right? There, there wouldn't be that same question of who is that information source. Um, and, and that's something that we can think about when we talk about how certain beliefs intersect with each other and then cause potential reactants um, to different intervention strategies and why you might need, as I said, mentioned, a sequenced approach where um, you, you, you think through who's sending the message and when those individuals outreach with their communities uh, about um, about the vaccine message. So, but I don't think we totally know, right? Opportunities to test sequenced intervention strategies are really hard to implement and evaluate. Um, and, and I don't even know if we're gonna be able to do that in this current pandemic as things are moving at a pace that are unprecedented. Um, and, and that makes me think we need to be really clever from a behavioral science and evaluation approach about how to evaluate post hoc some things that are being deployed in real time. Thank you. That's, uh, I hope that addressed the question. It certainly did for me. Um, we're now at 2.37 uh, p.m. That means uh, on Eastern time, it means we have about 23 minutes left. So what I wanna do is open up to all our panelists, as well as Dr. Sokol from uh, the NIA. Um, and at around, um, at around 2.50, I'll ask Luke to take over uh, and, and take us out to, uh, to the end. Uh, but Dr. Brandt, Dr. Millman, uh, do either of you um, have thoughts now, having heard uh, these three presentations and some of the questions that are coming? Um, for me, the big question is, what are, what are the big questions that we can answer now or that we should be trying to answer now? And also, as we look into the future, six months from now, a year from now, what are the questions that we can be preparing now uh, to address that are likely to become the most important? Um, just opening it up to everyone. I think Dr. Tiro made a really important point that uh, we need to be creative in our in our uh, application of methods to understanding opportunities for intervention and understanding who we're missing, uh, who's not at the table, who's part of it. I, I think we have to just be really agile. And that's a little bit counterintuitive to the process of our research in social and behavioral sciences, especially pursuing federal grant funding, for example. Uh, we have to think about rapid cycle approaches. And that's been something in implementation science that I think has been uh, really at the forefront of how can we demonstrate agility and creativity to really address challenges in real time. So the application of pragmatic trials and pragmatic approaches, um, trying something out, not everything has to be a randomized controlled trial for us to learn from it and for us to improve our processes and implementation. So I mentioned briefly during our talk 
uh, during my portion of today's webinar, this idea of facilitating cross state sharing, like what mechanisms exist, like what's what's happening in South Dakota, which has a political climate that has really promoted some disinformation related to the pandemic, yet every dose they're getting, they're using. I mean, really high proportions. What are they doing? How are they messaging in spite of some of these contextual factors? And then how can we take that and ad adapt it in other settings uh, for similar populations? Um, I also will mention, so in addition to that kind of agility and creativity and ability to apply methods in that manner, I also think there's a real opportunity to capitalize on work that Dr. Tiro and others are doing with the SEAL Alliance to make sure that we are leading with equity. I think this is so important in this case because we know populations that have been minoritized, marginalized, and excluded are now going to suddenly magically connect with inequitable institutions, systems, and structures to magically accept what's put before them. I mean, this is a legacy of trauma and distrust that can't quite frankly be overcome with any single intervention or action. It's going to have to be a combination of such. And so leading with equity is the right start but there's some incompatibility with the inequity that's inherent in many of these systems and structures that I think we have to take head on in our implementation processes. I agree with everything you just said. Um, I, I just wanna add that I think um, a key thing we should be thinking about is scalability, right? And, and obviously we're thinking about that in terms of the distribution plan, but I also think we need to be thinking about it in terms of the communication plan. And it's one of the reasons we focused on, you know, one cent text messages, because if you find something that works, you can turn around and actually at pretty reasonable cost send that to everyone in the state. Uh, and so I think the more we can think about using digital technologies that are low cost, for communication, the more we can build platforms that make that possible and partnerships even between states um, and, and you know, even recruiting people now to share their contact information or sign up for information, hotlines and, and text messages and emails and so on, the better position we'll be when we get to the phase of, of rollout where we're trying to encourage everyone to get vaccinated to be able to um, rapidly disseminate information over those channels. And also that's a place where A-B testing really can be done quickly. I totally agree with you, Heather, that we can learn a lot even when we can't do A-B testing. But you know, if, if you load up an email campaign, you actually can A-B test that like overnight and know what works and then scale. So I think the more we can go digital, the better and that we can lay the groundwork for that now. Um, and actually, let me say one more thing about equity really quickly. You might think like oh, maybe that would reduce equity but actually, at least in our work, think, uh, message, things like reminders and all these follow through challenges and planning prompts seem to work better for older adults. They seem to work better for minority communities. They work better for people with children. Basically, if your life is harder, because there's a lot going on, you're juggling more, actually, uh, these kinds of reminders and, and strategies we use to try to make it as simple as possible to follow through are even more powerful. Well, that was going to be my question. It's like you read my mind. <laughs> uh, that was going to be my question to you because something that has anecdotally been reported in the media is that in states like Florida, where they're using Eventbrite or Sign Up Genius or different tools like that for 75 and older uh, folks to sign up for vaccine appointments, and that's led to all these different scams. So there's discriminatory uh, skill that's needed in communication, and then only use using a single channel. So I think your point, Dr. Milkman, that is so important is that you're using, they may all be digital, but you're still using multiple channels. And, and there's different ways that messaging will resonate with people uh, through those different channels, even if they're all digital. And I'm so pleased to know about finding equity across those. That's, that's great to hear. Well, actually, I do. I love your point, though. And I do think um, another thing that people underappreciate is the value of old fashioned mail. <laughs> so one of the things that's been really interesting in a lot of behavioral sciences, how effective that single, you know, mailer you get um, 
can be compared to an email, which we're more likely to hit delete on. And particularly for older populations, I also think, you know, we know how to do mass marketing campaigns. It's been done before, and we should be also thinking about scaling those kinds of communication channels up. It can be even as a way to try to get people enrolled in text communication platforms, but uh, but when we can use mail, particularly for older populations, that can be helpful. Now, um, I think they're going to benefit a lot from mailed reminders or texted reminders. We do have to make sure we reach people. And I think that's, the, for me, the key that's the question, right, is unfortunately, we don't live in one of those countries where there's just one main mailing system, right, one main list, right? Not everyone goes to Walgreens as one pharmacy, et cetera. Um, and people are this fragmentation of the lists and the invitation processes means that some might get reached by these reminders and some might get totally missed. And unless they're active in getting themselves on that list, which speaks to a, a desire um, and a demand, um, then you're still not gonna have that reach. Now, I've been really ex excited from an equity perspective about how different organizations in Dallas have been coming together to create a stronger social safety net infrastructure. Um, it's one of the things that really excites me about what's happening from a community engagement perspective. Now, all of that, again, also then requires building the trust so that these lists, these distributions can happen um, in a more equitable way so that people can be response, can, can be reached as well as can respond and then give you the feedback that, yeah, this is working or no, this is not working for me or this is how what the reaction in, uh, to the community is um, by this one message. And that really does require engagement of community advocates and community organizers. I just wanna jump in and say one thing we've um, done in some other projects in partnership with a large state health department is they have, they do have contact information for a lot of uh, populations if you look across different databases. So Medicare and Medicaid often will have this information, SNAP beneficiaries. And so it can be compiled. It takes a little work on the on the part of the state health department. But um, when those things exist, that's the kind of um, backbone it would be ideal if each state were building right now, sort of thinking through what means of contact do we have? What you know, and obviously it has to be legal and so on. And, and try, if we can figure that out now, then by the time we're at phase two and phase three, we can do this communication more effortlessly. One of the questions that just popped up in the box is about the Kaiser data that are showing the high proportion of side effects reported. And this is a communication issue because the quote unquote side effects associated with receiving one of the two vaccines that are available are simply your immune system working. So after the first dose, many people experience only pain and soreness at the injection site, maybe a, a few mild symptoms after that. Um, but after the second dose, when our, the immune system is hit again, and now making even more of the memory to uh, help the body more quickly recognize it's scaling up for if there is an attack, um, it is likely for people to have a headache, to maybe feel a little nauseous, maybe have some aches and chills. That's a good sign. That is your immune system working to develop that protection for you. But in communication, it's called side effects. So that has a connotation that implies a negative experience when in fact, that is what you want to happen. Now, does, does it happen for everyone? No, some people have some you know, very, my, very, very mild, but even in the clinical trial data, a large number of people in these phase three trials, still a fairly low proportion. So, but I see that people have these concerns about um, side effects, so to speak, related to the vaccines. And I think we have to do a better job about communicating the, the, that is your immune system working. Like that's not a bad thing. I'm so sorry. I'm, yay, you have a headache. All right. You know, it's almost as if we're reinforcing that that's a good thing. We're glad to hear it. And so uh, I think we need to be more effective communicators in that regard as well. I do think managing expectations about side effects is really important and distinguishing between, you know, mild expected as a result of it being exposed to a, a vaccine versus serious um, side effects is, is, is really important. Um, and to not just be dismissive of them because then 
um, it, it again um, erodes the trust uh, with the population. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tiro, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Miltman. Um, you've really been excellent and, and you can see the appreciation in the Q and A's. Um, I, uh, I now wanna turn it over uh, to Dr. Luke Stokel uh, from the National Institute on Aging. Um, uh, also, one of the questions that came up is, is teeing you up really well, Luke, and that's um, what are the opportunities for uh, collaboration? What are the opportunities for testing some of these approaches that our experts have, have laid out for us, not only for uh, researchers in, uh, in academic institutions, but also for small businesses, tech startups, uh, other ways that uh, people can get involved in and address some of these issues our experts have laid out. Yeah, so thanks, Don. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, you probably see my son right now, I'm assuming. Uh, let me throw up my, somehow my PowerPoint slide disappeared. While I'm doing that, um, yeah, you know, I, I, um, I, I plan to spend a couple minutes just acknowledging um, all of you, um, you know, Dr. Brandt, uh, you know, Dr. Milkman, of course, and uh, let's see, I hope you're seeing this now. And uh, let me switch, should be good. Um, uh, and Dr. Um, Tiro uh, for just a fantastic set of talks. I mean, it's really quite amazing uh, the work that you're doing in such a rapidly changing environment. You know, I was thinking myself as an individual level researcher, um, you know, I think according to this SOBC model where I want to identify a phenotype, so a vaccine hesitancy phenotype, you know, figure out uh, what mechanisms are driving that hesitancy and, uh, you know, how can we develop, you know, a mechanism uh, focused intervention at the individual level that'll get them there. And then I look at, you know, I look at Dr. Brandt's uh, map of the uh, pharmacy partnerships and I'm like, yeah, well, that would, that would, that would do a lot of good if they weren't in one of those, you know, red, no pharmacy zones. <laughs> um, so I think this is crazy and those, those things will change. And um, I commend you on tackling a very complex problem. Um, also, I just wanted to acknowledge Don and Lily, a great job pulling this together, of course, um, as well as uh, some of our NIH uh, science of behavior change partners that um, are kind of behind the scenes that helped with the uh, organization or uh, development of this. Um, and in particular, uh, Will Acklin at the National Institute of Drug Abuse, uh, Becky Ferrer at the National Cancer Institute, um, and uh, Chandra Keller at the National Institute on Aging, where I am also. Um, uh, so I appreciate uh, their work. And anything I'm gonna say, I should also say it doesn't reflect the views of the NEH, they're, they're my own views. However, I am gonna be sharing uh, NIH resources, you see them up on the screen. Um, I will copy and paste these to the chat window um, after I am done. But we have a great communication resource, which I believe Dr. Brand shared in the chat window earlier. Um, we also uh, have some repositories for the research community. Um, you can, uh, there's two right here. Um, they offer a link to similar measures, but they're a little bit different. Um, and uh, the resources that they offer. So I encourage you uh, researchers to visit both of those. And then finally, um, uh, you know, we have some funding opportunities and I think like this has been a challenge for the research community, it's been a challenge for NIH uh, behavioral science to keep up with this rapidly moving landscape and the needs um, and that are gonna need to be addressed um, to uh, not only um, you know, uh, identify uh, known targets like misinformation um, or trust or things like that, but identify new um, drivers and new needs and uh, creative strategies for addressing those needs as they change so rapidly. So anyway, I support, or uh, these are some uh, opportunities. I strongly encourage anybody, and there's my email address um, if you uh, would like to communicate uh, further. And then finally, up at the top there, we have our NIH uh, coronavirus website, which has a slew of uh, information. Um, and I believe there's also another one, uh, Combat COVID, that HHS put out. I don't list that there, but it's another great resource. 
Finally, I want to do a plug. This uh, Don uh, has the science of behavior. He's the PI for or principal investigator for the um, NIH uh, Science of Behavior Change Program, which was a 10-year program run through the um, office of the director, uh, Dr. Francis Collins. Uh, it's called the Common Fund, for those that don't know. And uh, we're concluding that 10-year program. Luckily, uh, the National Institute on Aging was able to award um, Don and team with um, a grant to continue doing some of the excellent work that they had done in this program. But I encourage everyone to come. This is a fantastic um, capstone meeting coming up February 22nd and 23rd. I'll also put this link in the uh, in the in the window in the uh, chat window. But um, just going to be a fantastic set of speakers, and uh, you'll see what we've tried to do, and uh, mostly the challenges that we've identified and uh, the strategies that we. Uh, have tried to implement to address those needs, and um, again, a fantastic set of set of speakers. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm um, going to put these things in the window, and then if, I'll I'll turn it back to you, Don. Great, thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, this is this is certainly just the beginning, but um, we have. Uh, I feel like we've gotten a really uh, great uh, hour and a half, and uh, and I really appreciate all of our scientists and uh, and Luke. Uh, I don't know that we gave you the credit, but this was actually uh, Luke first brought this uh, to us as well as Becky Fair and uh, and others across NIH as an as an opportunity for us to bring these folks together. Thank you to all of our attendees who have brought excellent questions and excellent uh, energy here. And um, thanks to Lily. And um, anything you need from us experts, uh, Dr. Tiro, Dr. Brandt, Dr. Miltman, uh, you're doing work for all of us and we appreciate you. And if there's anything that the SOBC program, uh, Resource Coordinating Center can do for you, please let us know. And I'm sure I, uh, that's a, a sentiment shared by many others as well. I do want to give us. Thank you for hosting this, it was great. Thank you guys. Bye everyone.